Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Governor John Carney. Thank you for joining us for our weekly COVID-19 press conference. I'm joined once again this week by Dr. Carol Rattay, the Director of the Division of Public Health. Dr. Rattay, thank you for being with us today and for the great work of, of your team at Public Health. A.J. Shaw is back with us again today as well, uh, the Director of the Delaware Emergency Management Agency. We've got some important information to share with you about the status of COVID-19 spread in our, in our state, uh, things that we're seeing in terms of where that uh, spread exists, situations in our schools, and, and uh, what we're hearing back from contact tracers. So uh, we'll get to all that, but first I wanted to start out. Last week at this time, we were in the middle of an election, and I just want to thank the more than 500,000 uh, Delawareans who went to the polls uh, last Tuesday to express their preferences in the election. Uh, I want to thank every one of them for, for making the effort. Uh, we had almost 200,000 uh, Delawareans vote by mail or, or absentee vote, and we, so we were able to have a, a presidential election, an election for offices, statewide and local offices here in the state of Delaware during a COVID-19 pandemic and, and do it uh, safely. And to that end, I want to thank Anthony Albans and his team at the, uh, the Department of Elections, all the poll workers, all the individuals who were out there at the polls uh, monitoring and making sure that the new machines were working uh, well. Um, we were moving people through quickly. Uh, there were long lines, as I mentioned last week in our press conference at every polling place that I visited, uh, people were uh, waiting patiently, they were respectful of one another, uh, notwithstanding the, the candidates that they were uh, supporting. We had a lot of concern about different incidents that might occur. There may have been something that was isolated, but uh, I didn't hear of any of that, frankly, here in Delaware, and Delawareans are to be commended by uh, with that. Uh, in fact, all the Delawareans that I talked to, whether they're voting for me or not, or voting for uh, my uh, preferences or not, uh, were very respectful as they entered the polls and, and left them. And so we want to thank really everybody uh, for that. I also want to thank our uh, DTI, uh, Department of Technology, Information and Technology, for their efforts uh, and the cyber team uh, that we deployed from the National Guard who helped and uh, to secure uh, the election, uh, election systems, uh, the voter files, and all of that, and to the best of our knowledge, uh, everything went uh, smoothly there without, uh, without any problems. The new machines uh, worked uh, and worked well. You know, our thoughts and prayers are, are with uh, former uh, Elections Commissioner Elaine Manlove uh, and her beloved uh, husband Wayne, who, who were killed tragically in an automobile accident just the day before election, uh, we laid her to rest uh, yesterday and she just provided tremendous service to our state and was a great friend uh, to, to many of us. We're also, uh, we have uh, Veterans Day coming up and where we uh, show our support, our appreciation, our love, frankly, for those who fought and served uh, to protect our freedoms, to protect the freedoms that we exercised just a week ago on election day. Normally, uh, we celebrate Veterans Day with a ceremony out at the Delaware Memorial Bridge. It's always been one of my favorites going back to, uh, nearly 30 years to the days when I was actually a, a, a staff uh, assistant for then Senator Joe Biden. And it's an opportunity really to, uh, to thank uh, and, and show our appreciation for those uh, who, uh, who served our country. We're also this year honoring and recognizing 245 years of the United States Marine Corps. What an incredible uh, group of, of patriots, and they have served proudly for 245 years, always the first ones in and never leaving anyone behind. So to, to each of, of you who served in the Marines, thank you for your tremendous service. And to all our veterans, uh, thank you. Uh, as we celebrate uh, your patriotism and your service to our country on tomorrow. <clears throat> so let's go to the, the data. Um, we're up to uh, 27,000 total positive COVID-19 cases in our state. Sadly, uh, the fatalities continue to rise at 722. 
One of the things that we look at every week is the number of hospitalizations, 127 currently, which is the highest it's been in some time. Uh, still, we still have a fair amount of capacity there, but this is a, a concerning number uh, that we're well over 100 hospitalizations now. Just a week or two ago, we were uh, just around the 100 uh, number, just around 100, and now we've ticked up. Uh, and this tends to be a lagging indicator. We're gonna see in a few minutes that we're seeing increased cases, uh, not as dramatically uh, as other states, but certainly uh, very serious increases that uh, we're dealing with uh, presently. So let's look at the distribution, 14,000, uh, approaching 15,000 positive cases in Newcastle County, uh, 3,800 in Kent County. Kent County, the cases there have continued to be uh, the lowest and, and most stable, if that's the right terminology, but uh, just uh, doing a pretty good job in Kent County with respect to new positive cases. Sussex County continues to have the most uh, positive cases now at 8,600. Again, as we've not noted in the, pa in the past uh, week, two weeks, a uh, significant number of hospitalizations have occurred in Sussex County as well, and, and we know that we have uh, less capacity there than, than we do in the northern part of our state. One of the, the uh, criteria that we look at very closely is the percent of the tests that, uh, that are given that are positive, right? And we've changed, we've been talking about this now for about a month, the way we've calculated uh, this percentage, that the, the uh, World Health Organization target is 5%. Uh, for the majority of the time that we were doing this, we were just calculating the percentage based on the persons who were testing positive, which is the top line there, 11.8%. So if you've been tested once and you get tested again, it doesn't uh, get counted as part of the denominator in the calculation for the percentage. And so you can see that when you calculate the percentage of tests, which include people who have tested more than once, including myself, I think I'm, I'm up to four times being tested, uh, you know, in the, in the top calculation, if I got tested again, I wouldn't be included in that calculation. And we'll, you'll see in a minute the difference between the number of persons that have been tested and the number of tests that have been administered. And so there's a little bit of confusion out there about what this exactly means. The middle measure, the percentage of tests, is actually the one that most states are using. Uh, that we will continue to transition to and will give us a better idea of the spread uh, because we'll actually be calculating it with the number of people who are getting tested on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the number that's w way too high is the number of new cases today at a seven-day moving average of 241. And for those of us, and there are lots of you, probably hundreds, maybe even thousands of you that follow their our data dashboard on a day-to-day -day basis have been tra tracking this, you'll know that that number is considerably higher than it used to be. Uh, going back a month or two during the summertime, AJ, when we were thinking about whether we were on or off a quarantine list with New Jersey and New York. And our target then was just was under 100 new cases per day. So you, we're, you can see we're two plus times that, but we're also doing more tests. And the test, the percent positive, gives us an idea of, of uh, the comparison between two months ago and today. What's unacceptable, what we're worried about, is the fact that we have 241 seven-day moving average new cases, new cases per day, and it's going the wrong direction. So fundamentally, our message today is, particularly as we move into the Thanksgiving holiday season, we need to do a better job. We need to make sure we're wearing our masks in public and in private. We need to make sure we're keeping in social distancing. We need to make sure that we're particularly monitoring social environments where people go out to, not necessarily go out to a restaurant, but invite people over to watch a, the, a sporting event or a movie on TV and you know have drinks and cocktails and, and enjoy one another's company without masks on. That's where we're seeing a lot of transmission, and Dr. Rattay is going to go over some of the information that we're gathering by, by having interviews with people who test positive. What we need to do is we need to push that 
number of new cases uh, per day down, get it below 200 uh, and, and, and continue to make progress getting it below that. So here's the total number of tests. On the right is the almost 600,000 uh, total tests that have been there. That's each an in individual test, whether you've been tested once or not. The 369,000 is the number of persons. So you don't count somebody more than once, once they get tested. And you can see what a difference that would make in calculating uh, the percent positives. Because as you do, as we do our testing, AJ, 2,000, 5,000 a day, you know, some number of those on this kind of ratio are gonna be people that have been tested before. And in fact, we're encouraging people at the university community, they're encouraging their students and faculty, teachers and staff to get tested and get tested more at once. And so that number on the left, the 369,000 and its day-to-day -day equivalent is gonna be less meaningful, is less meaningful than it was five months ago. And so the number that we're using now is the total number of tests administered to make that calculation. And so there's been a lot of questions about that. Uh, and you just need to remember your middle school math and percentage calculations to, to understand uh, the relevance of the new measure, the new calculation with the new denominator uh, to do the evaluation of, of percent positive. So here's the graph we show uh, each week, and you can see on that top line, which is the young adult line, ages 18 through 34, you can see it's starting to, to pick, pick up there, and it has been separating itself, meaning that subcategory, that demographic has uh, experience more of COVID-19 spread than any other, and it's connected with unstructured social environments mostly. University communities, as we've said uh, for weeks, we were in pretty good shape a week or two ago. We're seeing a little bit of an uptick after Halloween. Halloween, Halloween parties and Halloween activities that maybe weren't as structured as should be. Let's look at our COVID-19 data dashboard. Here's the 14-day view. The top uh, left is current hospitalizations, the one that is most concerning as we've ticked up to 127 hospitalized today. Our 14-day view of new hospitalizations, again, that tends to be a little bit up and down. It's still on a downward trend, uh, but obviously adding new people to those hospital, that hospital census on a day-to-day -day basis. The new positive cases is very episodic, meaning up and down on a day-to-day -day basis today, mostly because we're doing and getting results from testing in big batches. And so you see, if you look at the orange line, the orange or gold line, that's the day-to-day -day number of new positive cases. That's the top far right. And the blue bars represent the seven-day moving average. So it's more a gradual but headed in the wrong direction, as I said, uh, to the point today where we're uh, too far over 200 uh, in territory we don't want to be in. And so we are back on quarantine lists and have been for a couple of weeks now in New Jersey, New York, and, and Connecticut, uh, Washington, D.C., and others. On the bottom, you can st see the bottom left and center are the two uh, ways of calculating percent positives. The far left with the persons tested, meaning just the people that have tested. Once they're tested, once they're not ca counted again, and you see it's a much bigger number. The number, uh, the one in the middle, is the percentage of tests, so additional tests for individuals. And so that's a smaller number because the denominator is going to be a larger number. And so that's at 4.4%, I think it was, seven-day moving average, under 5%. Uh, we'll talk about gating criteria for schools and the criteria for movement from yellow to red is at 8%, so we're still below that. But that's a measure we will continue to look at. In other states, that number's a lot bigger than that. And I think in 26 or seven states, Dr. Rattay is shaking her head, yes, that uh, they're above 8%, which we'll talk about, she'll talk about in a little bit. So let's take a look, let's take another step back or another step up and look at the 90-day view. You can clearly see the trends 
and we're in a trends, trend right now, a bad trend, of new positive cases. You can see that on the top far right. The uh, orange line is the day-to-day -day count, and the blue uh, bars, very narrow bars in this chart, are, um, are the seven-day moving average, but moving in the wrong direction from a summertime low where we were down around 50 new cases, I want to say, to now where we're closing in on 250. So percent of persons tested, again, same basic uh, shape, but at a higher level. Um, there we go. The, the middle, I'm sorry, the, top, the bottom left and middle for those percent positives, 90-day look. AJ got his gloves in, so we've got uh, our uh, personal protective equipment. All the, all the beaks are fill, full there. So just a, a reminder that the nonprofit relief uh, funding from the CARES Act round two is now open. So for nonprofit organizations that have provided critical services during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, please learn more about the, this uh, relief funding at decaresfunds.org. You can find out more about it and how to apply. Um, and the, the question as we, as we think about where we are with respect to the spread of COVID-19 today, uh, we're in a kind of an inflection point where we have uh, decisions to make because we essentially have too many uh, of our neighbors who are attending gatherings, mostly social gatherings, informal gatherings, maybe in private homes or in their own homes without masks and other precautions. More larger crowds than, than should be. And so we're seeing the, the, the positive cases are telling the contact tracers that they probably got it at this kind of a venue. And not so much at structured retail establishments, bars, restaurants, schools, all, all of the above where people are following uh, the requirements for mask wearing, social distancing, and, uh, and doing a better job out of it. Our overall goals, as we've said for some time, are to have a healthy community, to get more children back in schools, and every school district now is gradually moving uh, children back for in-person instruction, not every day, uh, doing it safely with fewer children in, in schools in front of teachers. Uh, some days the children are learning remotely. Other days, again, they're in in-person instruction and to get more Delawareans on the job. So those three objectives, and it's all really follows from having a healthy community, meaning fewer daily new positive uh, COVID-19 cases. And so we need everybody to lean in right now because we're contemplating, I've asked the Division of Public Health to look at what other states are doing around us, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, to consider some of the restrictions that, that we had in place before, to come up with ideas that are focused on where the problem really is. And some of it is in venues that we just don't have as much influence and control over. And it's coming up with the, the Thanksgiving holiday where we're seeing a lot of that right in front of us. Usually my family, a big family, Nearly 30 of us get together and have a big family gathering. We're probably not going to do that, mostly because my mother, who's almost 90 years old, is in that vulnerable population. Uh, we have, she has grandchildren that have been going to school. Uh, she's got uh, children, adult children, who live all over uh, this part of, this, uh, of the state and, and all over the country, frankly, which aren't traveling in. And it's a sacrifice for sure, but we, wanna, we, we don't want our, our mom to get sick and to be exposed to, uh, to the COVID-19. So we're thinking about what are the restrictions that we can put in place uh, that we may be forced to put in place because the spread continues to increase. And so we need everybody to wear a mask, to keep social distancing, to keep your gathering small and with, within family units do virtual get-togethers. I had a, a Zoom call with my two sons last night, and, uh, you know, it wasn't the best, but we had a chance to find out what was going on with their 
their jobs and in their lives, and, and uh, that's important for all of us. And so just follow these instructions so that we can avoid uh, some of the restrictions that we know uh, other states are putting in place and that we may have to be put in place, have to put in, get put in place as well. The next slide, I'm not sure I understand the whole thing behind this slide, but I understand most young people who watch television series would know what this really means. But for me, it means winter is coming, the weather is getting colder, people are going to be more gathered inside, and so we need to be careful, more careful about wearing masks and keeping social distancing. Uh, the next slide, again, is something that uh, we wanted to, just to accentuate the need uh, to wear a mask um, and to keep social distancing during this holiday season. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Rete, who's got some very important information to share about what we've been learning about the spread of the virus, uh, the risks associated with it, uh, particularly in uh, school settings, uh, and some of the decisions that we have ahead of us. Thank you, Dr. Rete. Thank you so much, Governor. So we are seeing increases, clearly, in the data. I want to start by showing you the geographic areas of, of concern. Now, we've been presenting this information by zip code for probably six to eight weeks using the same methods. And um, this, by far, is the largest number of zip codes in the state of Delaware that are meeting this criteria of, of areas of concern. We are seeing our biggest increases this past week in Newcastle County. So while Sussex still has the highest case rates, uh, the highest rise in cases and percent positives is in Newcastle County. As you can see, Bear is back on our watch list, uh, not only 19701, but we have a high number of cases in the Bear Christiana area, as well as Stanton and Newcastle. Um, Newark has rejoined the areas of concern with UD students as well as, um, as, as, well as individuals um, not UD students. So we are, again, seeing some increases in the uh, Newark areas, especially 19711. Um, sorry, Governor, but Claymont is on the list this week. Uh, moving a bit further down, um, Middletown and Townsend are also areas in which we are seeing uh, increased uh, numbers of cases. So we have a, a close eye on Middletown and Townsend at this point. Moving down to Sussex County, uh, Seaford, Laurel, and Del Delmar continue to be uh, the hottest spots in that area, but uh, we're also um, seeing Delmar and um, I'm sorry, Lincoln and Ellendale are on, um, on the map, Selbyville, as well as Rehoboth, Dewey, and Bethany are on the list. And sadly, Georgetown is, is back on the, the areas of, of concern list. So clearly a number of areas in uh, Delaware now. The middle of the state um, uh, has some increases in, in cases but um, certainly not uh, to the degree as now north and, and south. Um, let me shift gears to talk a little bit about long-term care. Um, we still have five facilities that have significant, significant numbers of cases between um, September 25th and uh, November 6th. Uh, we have over 60 cases that have had either a positive um, staff member or um, resident over over this time period. And so as Secretary McGarrick talked about last week, we're doing a number of things to really um, enhance our response and support for long-term care, including hiring a new medical director and um, building incident response teams to help. Um, we're really thrilled that um, uh, we learned uh, just a few days ago from the federal government that we are receiving um, a federal asset called Disaster Medical Assistance Teams, or DMAT. Um, this is an asset that we had in the spring to help support us 
And um, again, uh, we learned on Thursday that we got approval for the uh, DMAT team, which just began yesterday on Monday. Um, the, it's the, the same team of five amazing uh, VA nurses. Um, these, um, these folks are great in working with our, um, our long-term care facilities. The facilities are very comfortable with them. They, they are uh, now beginning to do again, especially with the facilities where we have the, the greatest concerns is supporting them with infection control procedures, uh, whether that's you know how to isolate or quarantine or use PPE or support with their testing programs. Um, they're here to really um, uh, just really provide whatever support these facilities need to uh, to um, control spread of infection in these facilities. Also, we're really excited that when the incident response teams get get up, um, this is a great team to help uh, train the incident response teams. So again, really grateful to these amazing VA nurses who are um, really um, sacrificing these, their their time to be a part of our uh, our response here in Delaware. Let me do another shift here and talk about schools. Um, as uh, we've talked about um, several times and the governor mentioned as well today, uh, we are um, looking closely, I think everyone's looking closely at the school reopening criteria. And I think we've all seen that our case rates have increased um, this week to 135, which keeps it uh, in the red and really makes it more firmly in the red. Um, but our percent positives, um, they have gone up to 4.3%, um, which has them in the yellow, and hospitalizations, as you heard, have also gone up, which um, has them in the yellow at um, a rate of 11.4. On the next slide, you'll see how we are um, uh, taking a deeper dive into uh, kind of better understanding what our community spread looks like and what our testing rates look like uh, to inform decision making. And so if you go to the next slide, you'll see that, um, again, we are not only in the red for case rates, but also in the red for percent change for case rates, um, in the red or in the yellow for um, percent positive, but in the in the red for the change in percent positive. Um, we're in the green for testing, so AJ, we're doing great with testing, which is which is awesome. Um, but uh, um, hospitalizations again is 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 trending in the in the wrong direction. Even though it's a light green, um, we we are headed in the, in the wrong direction. So we're we're certainly keeping a really close eye on uh, on this, but also uh, really important that we're keeping a close eye of what we're seeing as far as um, cases in the school setting or related to the school setting. So on the next slide, um, as we have been sharing on every Friday in our press releases, um, we, we share the numbers for staff and students in private and public schools. Um, this is a cumulative number, so this is the total number from September 1st um, up to uh, last Friday. And as you can see, in private schools, we have 40 staff and 78 students. And in public schools, 110 staff and 63 students. What this means is these are individuals who were potentially infectious while they were are in, in the school setting. Um, but what's really important here is that of all the deep dives we're looking into, every single one of those cases, COVID-19 is not being spread primarily in our schools. And the spread is really occurring external to the school. So the spread is really happening outside the school setting. So we really wanted to take a, a, a little bit of a deeper dive for you all today so you could kind of see what we're seeing to, and give you some examples. So on the next slide, well, I... I, I Again, the, the, the key point is really in-school spread is really rare. So we have really three examples for staff where we've seen in-school spread. And with these examples, um, it involves s staff eating lunch together. And, and as I'm going to mention multiple times today, eating is really risky because people don't have their masks on with, 
when they're eating. We, we haven't figured out a way to eat with a mask on. I don't know that we ever will. So you have to be able to social distance when eating. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have seen a, a consequence, you know, in the school setting uh, three times now with uh, staff who have been eating um, less than six feet apart where we have seen some in-school spread. Um, but we are seeing, um, and in one of those examples, one of those individuals attended a wedding, which we know is a high-risk event, and so that's how it was brought. That individual then, you know, um, was eating lunch with colleagues close together, and, and so it spread. So we've got kind of a high-risk event and a high-risk event matched together, and you can see how, how that spread happened. But again, spread among staff is, is not common in the school setting. Staff are doing an amazing job overall in the school setting with following the guidance, with face covering and social distancing uh, for staff and, and students. And, and this is why we're not seeing spread in the school setting. But we just, we are seeing a lot of um, what I think is normal socialization, which of course we all enjoy uh, but taking place outside of the school settings that are um, really leading to this high number of staff um, uh, and really high numbers of Delawareans uh, becoming positive for, for COVID. On the next slide, um, people want to know how much, you know, spread are we seeing between students? And we've only seen two examples, two examples that we know of where there has been spread bes between students and schools. One involved... Um, uh, likely one student infected another uh, while they were playing tackle football at recess without a mask. We have one other example of two students who were eating together and not socially distanced. So um, that is likely how the one individual became infected from the other. Uh, but in all these examples of, or I shouldn't say all these examples, in these five examples of, of in-school spread, which is really, really not much at all, um, it was because uh, the individuals weren't social distanced or weren't wearing a mask. Uh, but we are seeing, you know, in the students that um, are in those numbers that we, that we mentioned who are positive cases, um, you know, some um, have involved students carpooling without masks, so that's a higher risk setting than I think people are, are realizing. Um, got to have masks on if you're in a car with somebody who's not in your household. Um, slumber parties and other socializing uh, taking place among students is how we're seeing a number of them being infected. Um, we also have an example of a travel baseball team that went out of the state and uh, 10 individuals um, associated with this team became positive. So, um, you know, we know from the uh, interviews that uh, members of the team and families were eating together and, um, and were together outside of the game. So not sure how the infection happened, but we know that um, distancing and, and mask wearing wasn't, um, wasn't followed at all times. So on the next, um, next I want to use an example, which is, is, which is just kind of common right now and, and something that we really want people to be a, aware of that parties, parties are of concern. So one example is a, a, a staff member hosted a party of about 20 individuals and um, there were individuals from multiple schools, staff members from multiple schools involved. And at this point we know of at least 11 cases um, from that um, indoor party uh, who have uh, individuals who, who are now positive. Another example um, involves a, a student who attended a, a large family gathering and, and later they, they found out that the grandfather tested positive and so the, the, and there was no social distancing or mask usage at the gathering. And um, so then three days later, both the mother and the brother tested positive. So, so these are really examples of what we are are commonly seen. Again, the in-school spread is, is really, really rare, but it's what's happening in the community. And so, you know, with all of our data that we're looking at, with the clusters that our epidemiologists are, are analyzing, 
it's social gatherings and it's large social gatherings and it's small so social gatherings and the, this is you know even you know four people getting together to, to you know to watch a football game or um, you know activities where people would normally engage in being together oftentimes eating oftentimes drinking uh, where they're not wearing face coverings weddings funerals we have seen unfortunately a number of outbreaks related to religious services, some with very high numbers of infected people. But we've also seen a number of infections related to house parties. And in general, if I were to choose one behavior that I think is really driving a lot of cases, it's people eating indoors um, with, with either household members, because we are seeing in household spread, or people who aren't a member of their household. Eating indoors, people aren't wearing face coverings, and that's really driving a large amount of the spread that we are seeing in, a, in our state right now. So we have to get a handle on how we approach social activities because this is how this virus is being transmitted. And the recommendations are, are not gonna be what people wanna hear. Um, the, this is really, this is really tough. On the next slide, here's kind of some key points. Only dine at home or in restaurants with people who live with you, unless you're dining outside and distanced. You know that's better, but don't spend time with people outside of your household. And if you do, make sure that it's outdoors and that you're socially distanced and wearing a face covering at all times. And don't plan on holding holiday dinners with people outside of your household, um, even, even with family members outside of, out of, outside of your household. Uh, we've gotta keep it small this year. And we really, truly hope that this is the last year that we need to say this, but it's, it's important that we do everything we can to turn this around right now. We are looking at the possibility of new restrictions, as the governor just mentioned, and, and we, we really have to, to target these, inter, these interventions, these restrictions, as, as where we're seeing the spread. So looking at reducing the number of people permitted at both public and, and private gatherings is on the list. A number of states are implementing curfews on certain days uh, where we know more people are, are likely to gather. Um, we, we may have to consider strict restrictions on sports activities, uh, perhaps indoor activities um, or, or tournaments where there's a lot of mixing um, or um, further updates to mask requirements. And we're telling you this now because this is not what we want to do. We don't want to be in a position where we have to put further further restrictions in place, but we also don't want to have to close school again and you know, have any additional impact on the, the economy. This virus wants to spread and this virus doesn't care. This virus doesn't care if you are tired of being cautious. This virus wants to spread and any moment you are not cautious is when it may get to you or your family or friends. So all of us as Delawareans have a responsibility and the ability to help us turn this around. And we are asking that you help us so we don't have to take additional actions. We can do this, Delaware. We know that we can. So let me shift to something a little bit more positive, which is the vaccine. Um, we got some exciting news yesterday that the, the Pfizer vaccine may be much more effective than any of us ever expected. And it still needs to complete the FDA review and approval process. Uh, but we in Delaware continue to ready ourselves for the receipt of this vaccine. The COVID-19 vaccination task force continues to meet to develop our operational plan. Um, our response to the COVID, uh, to the CDC um, playbook was just published last week. So we now have a spot on our website uh, for the vaccine. You can find our playbook, you can find the executive summary there. Um, I also wanna mention that our ethics committee met last week um, to discuss the first groups that would receive the vaccine when it's available. 
Uh, we anticipate that the initial supply um, will be very limited. So we've been looking at the guidance from the ACIP, which comes out under CDC, um, and the first group of, of uh, individuals that the, the eth ethics committee agrees with ACIP, certainly all those in long-term care uh, workers and residents, but also high-risk workers um, who provide direct patient care, um, especially to those who may be COVID positive, are very high on the list, as are um, all first responders, as um, they don't know when they're encountering people with COVID and they must be protected. Um, in uh, Tier B, or the second group, uh, in the first wave, um, again, high priority individuals include high risk workers in, in all healthcare facilities not covered in 1A, so that would be primary care or those providing non direct patient care, also those with underlying health conditions and those in, in other congregate uh, settings um, would be in tier B. So, um, you know, the ethics committee is going to continue to uh, to meet and work through these. Um, additionally, there's a communications subcommittee that held its first meeting yesterday. Um, it's really important that we are effectively communicating what we know about the safety and the efficacy of the vaccine. When will this come to Delaware? We're not sure, but we are ready. We were told that it could come in October, so we are, are have been doing everything we need to be ready. Um, we know it's 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 certainly not coming in October. At one point we got a November 15th date. We don't think that's going to happen either, but we will be ready whenever it comes. Uh, we're thinking that's probably going to be December, but again, um, we are um, anxiously awaiting uh, the arrival of the vaccine in Delaware. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Governor. So thank you, Dr. Rattay, for ending your presentation with really good positive news uh, with respect to uh, the possibility of a vaccine. So there's a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the efficacy really impressive in the 90% uh, range. And uh, as I understand, working with uh, the diverse population, some additional work that needs to be done before uh, they start uh, moving the, the uh, doses out to, to those uh, specific populations that you mentioned. But in the meantime, we got to hold on. And we've got to do better than we're doing. We've got to tighten things up. Again, we've been saying this for weeks about uh, the informal social settings and gatherings, uh, which is where the virus is most insidious and gets out and infects people and, uh, and is transmitted one from the other. And so we really need to, to focus and lean in on those uh, on restrictions and gas ma uh, um, mask wearing in those environments. And, and, and I'm confident too that we can, we can do it. And if we do it, we'll be able to to reach, reach our objectives of uh, continuing to move children into classrooms and to getting more people back uh, on the job and, and uh, getting our economy going again. AJ, I know tremendous work that your team is doing on the testing front, and I know you got more information there today. Uh, thank you, and uh, just so you know, we removed all the Game of Thrones references from the, this part <laughs> of the presentation. Um, starting off with school testing, so Dr. Tay spent a lot of time talking about uh, schools and what we're doing uh, with public health and the liaisons and contact tracing. So I want to talk about kind of back up and what we've done really since uh, prior to Labor Day to assist the school districts with uh, testing as they were getting ready to not only having teachers go back in the buildings and staff, but then also uh, entering kind of a hybrid environment. So over the last three months, uh, we've assisted over 60 school districts with on-site testing. Uh, we've done this through uh, multiple different vendors and partners that we've used to uh, you know, provide capacity in state. Uh, these have been done with the, in coordination with the school districts. We use them to help spread the word. So they have the uh, schools available to us and they're spreading it out through their email blasts and phone notifications to make sure parents and students knew they had that accessibility um, right at their schools prior to uh, going back into school. Well, we knew that was only a snapshot time. We know the testing is only good for really the time it was taken. So what do we do for ongoing? Um, we know we have ample uh, community testing, but we also want to make sure we are doing something to be as flexible with the school districts as well. So Mako Medical, another vendor that we've uh, contracted with, is coordinating directly with school districts to offer you know, multiple days of testing a month uh, at th different district schools, knowing that this would be a complementary um, 
process to our community testing and at home testing that we're doing. So that has been going very well and just uh, started a few more sites up here in Newcastle County for the next few weeks. And then we continue to do routine at home testing for the staff and the teachers of uh, schools and uh, all those that have uh, other issues getting to a site. Uh, we've issued over 25,000 URLs for um, that at home testing kits. And again, that is open up to Delaware residents or people that work in Delaware as well. So that's schools. Let's take it up a level and talk about just about the testing volume. Uh, just last three months, so or last two months, and then kind of November, as of uh, November 6th. Uh, 86,000 in September. Uh, we talked about how we saw a little bit of a decrease uh, there. October, 131,000. So we you know, pushed hard in October. Uh, we set up additional uh, sites in uh, Newcastle County with the assistance of the county executive to really help us get to the school district. So some of the sites I was talking about on the previous slide, uh, you know, Red Clay, Christiana, Abiquiminic, you know, we were doing multiple days uh, there for their students. Uh, October really kind of is now the new high water mark. Uh, it really blew our last number out of uh, the water for July and August. Uh, November, uh, just as of the uh, 6th of November, we were at 23,000. Uh, just to put that in comparison, in April we did 26,000 tests over the full month. May, when we started our community testing campaign, uh, we were at 44,000. Uh, yesterday we set a single uh, daily high, which isn't even in this number, of uh, 5,200 tests just done on yesterday. So when the governor was talking about some of those uh, peaks and valleys in the positive new cases, uh, a great example is Sunday there was limited testing um, that was completed. So it would be the Walgreens, it would be some of the testing done in long-term care facilities. Monday we're back on full throttle with you know multiple sites across the state. We did 5,000. So you're gonna probably see one day with a little bit smaller number. Then we're gonna get probably a large number of those results back for that 5,000 you know, between today and tomorrow. And then we'll have a, a day with potentially higher numbers. So uh, you really have to kind of look at where the sites are, what day the testing took place to understand the, uh, yeah, the if, number. If I can day. interrupt there, AJ. I mean, that's a really important point as we look at uh, the day-to-day -day number of positive cases, right? Because you get big batches of these results. They don't all come in under the same uh, time frame. And so you get big batches on one day, so it's a big number. And the next day, it's significantly less. The seven-day moving average really becomes more and more important, I would say, over the last month or two as we've tried to assess what is the spread actually look at. The simple reality is the numbers are getting higher and uh, they're unacceptably high at this juncture. But sometimes you get thrown off with a really big number uh, that's just a function of the testing and the results coming in. Well, ab absolutely, and I think, we we'll also want to talk about November. We have, uh, what, the second of uh, three holidays tomorrow. Uh, we continue to test as many days as possible. So again, we have sites open tomorrow. Uh, we will have uh, testing available over the Thanksgiving holiday as well. Might be at a, a little bit different tempo. We want to make sure uh, it, it's used if, uh, we, if and where we have it offered. So we'll coordinate with public health and our other partners to make sure that gets communicated in advance. Um, the other question I know we have a lot, a lot that I wanted to cover a little bit more in detail today is the turnaround times of the labs. So in Delaware, we primarily have three partners that we utilize for state-sponsored events. Um, Curative, which has been the, uh, I guess, the, a great standard, a great partner since uh, May that we uh, engage with them. Uh, they are the ones that are, we either the trailers at right now, or if we go to one of our bigger drive-throughs, they're the ones facilitating it. Um, we have Vault, which is the at-home process, so what we use for uh, the teachers and uh, staff of schools, as well as those that sign up online. And then the Walgreens uh, partnership, which is run at the uh, Delaware Public Health uh, Lab. So we know from Curative, um, you know, from the time a collection gets sampled to the, to gets taken to the time that that individual uh, receives that notification is under 24 hours. It was uh, 21.5 hours last week. Uh, we had a information on a call this morning. Somebody uh, went yesterday got tested uh, yesterday afternoon, had the results this morning when they woke up. So even sometimes we're closer to the 14, 15 hours there. Vault, uh, 17 hours 
from the time that they receive the package. So remember, this is something that you request, get sent to you, you log online and, and complete it, you drop it off in the UPS mailbox. So from the time it gets to the lab in New Jersey and they receive most of their shipments uh, by 10 o'clock in the morning, from that time on, it's less than 17 hours. Uh, so again, you could almost plan that out to the hour or the day that you wanna get your results back. And the Walgreens is less than 72 hours um, across the board. I think that number is probably, we could even probably say 48, but I wanna make sure we, uh, you know, over, under promised and over delivered on that one. Um, and we have email and text notification for them as well. Uh, Mako, the company that uh, we are doing with schools right now is right around the 24 hour mark as well. Uh, they are on site maybe a few days a week and then get those right up to their lab up in Pennsylvania. So they're under 24 hours as well. People sign up online as well, do a uh, portal registration, and they're able to get their uh, results um, as soon as they're completed. Uh, testing this week, uh, 26 pop-up sites. Uh, again, uh, going for a new record uh, on top of the 22 statewide uh, permanent locations. And then again, don't forget about the at-home testing, a great feature that we could be using going into the holiday season, especially if people are looking to travel or if students are coming home from a, uh, a school or someplace out, out of the state or out of the region. DE.gov slash home test to register uh, for that. Um, know your status. We want to make sure that all the testing sites are updated. These are the ones that the states do. This is the ones we hear from our partners in the community, whether it's uh, the hospitals, whether it's some of the uh, federally qualified healthcare systems that we work with. So a lot of information is at de.gov slash get tested. Uh, last, last slide I have is 30 seconds to talk about the disaster declarations. So back in March when we started uh, COVID, uh, a presidential disaster declaration was approved for every state and territory in the United States. Uh, and we have to date been able to recapture some um, expenses that either the state or qualifying nonprofits have uh, put in for. We have $37 million obligated back through that with 44 projects that are also in uh, works. Tropical Storm Isaias, which hit us in early August. We also received a presidential disaster declaration for Kent County, and that was for public assistance as well. When we do a disaster declaration, public assistance is for uh, this response from the state in uh, emergency services, utility companies that are nonprofits, um, as well as any public infrastructure damage. Uh, and then the individual assistance side is what helps the individuals out. We did not have the magnitude for individual assistance, but we did for public assistance. It got approved for Kent County. And just uh, this weekend, we submitted an appeal for Newcastle County for public assistance to try and uh, recoup some of the uh, funds that uh, the county, the municipalities, uh, DelDOT, DENREC, uh, state police uh, incurred over that uh, really five-day event that we had that had a lot of damage up in, uh, up in Delaware. So that is it, sir. Back to you. Thank you much, uh, AJ. And it needs to be said, a uh, word of thanks to, to you, to our partners at Newcastle County, to everyone that's chipped in uh, to just blow past our, our original goal of 80,000 uh, tests per month. I didn't think we could get it. I always thought it was going to be a a stretch goal, and yet you've uh, you set the record at what was it, 131, uh, 130, almost 132,000, and you're on pace uh, to go up over 100,000 again this month. Significant testing in communities, particularly vulnerable communities, so critically important, and uh, just really a, an outsta outstanding effort. And also something that people need to focus on and be aware of as we assess the spread of the virus on a day-to-day -day basis. When you look at the number of positive cases, you gotta compare it to the number of tests that were done, the percent positive. Again, we're still, we're getting, we're not where we wanna be. Uh, the percent positives are, are getting worse, the number of positive cases are getting worse, but we are under the target there on percent positives of 5%, even with your big number at the University of Delaware that came in right at 5%, I think. Correct. And so, but we do need to, to uh, Buckle up a little bit. Uh, we need to be conscious of the, the social gatherings uh, of Thanksgiving and the holidays to make sure uh, that we protect ourselves and, most importantly, our neighbors. Just a reminder about uh, the uh, downloading the app uh, onto your phone. It's a way to help protect yourself uh, by slowing the spread and, and just being uh, made aware of, of coming in contact with somebody who's uh, tested 
uh, COVID-19 positive, you've been within six feet of them for 15 minutes. Uh, if, they're, if they voluntarily uh, sign up with the COVID alert DE, and you do, then you'll, you'll get an alert to let you know that you've been potentially exposed and you can take appropriate uh, action. We're in flu season. Make sure you get your flu shot uh, con of concern uh, to a certain extent uh, with respect to um, the hospitalization number that we talked about earlier. So far, uh, the, the feedback we've gotten from the hospitals is they haven't seen a tremendous uptick in hospitalizations due to the flu. It's still early there. I think, and so we need to be very careful and try to push those hospitalization rates down by following the guidance and the restrictions uh, and protecting, preventing the spread. So with that, we have some media in, in the room and we have some pre-submitted questions. I see Tom or Sarah, whoever wants to go first. Um, thank you again for joining us. Well, good. So, Governor, I have a question. Over the weekend uh, at the Biden event, there were a lot of people outside the security perimeter, mostly masked, but not really all that socially distant. Um, and in a lot of cases, people who were not, you know, from the same household. So do you think it was appropriate to see that kind of a crowd out there? And are you worried about an outbreak stemming from that? Event? Yeah, I do. I, I worry about it like I worried about some of the social protests that we had in the spring. You know, uh, most people, as you as you observed, were wearing masks because I saw them leaving. The event itself uh, was uh, done in consultation with public health in terms of social distancing and uh, and the measures taken there. Everybody had masks on again. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the spontaneous crowd that just kind of gathered, uh, there are things that, that are, you know, frankly hard to control, uh, but the, uh, the formal uh, gathering did have a consultation with public health and a plan in place to, to, uh, with an approval to do so. Carol, do you have any thoughts about the crowd that was outside the perimeter? Oh, by the way, and what, if I didn't mention this, I think uh, I did, but if I didn't mention it, people who were there should get tested. Just like we recommended those who were involved in the social protests to, to, should get tested as well. Carol, do you have any thoughts about just the crowd itself? I mean, I was DPH checking in on that because, you know, again, you may have had the formal event inside, but there were a lot of people outside that were not, I mean, that was pretty, it was very unstructured. Yeah, Tom, so uh, you do, as, as the governor said, we do um, have concerns about any, any gathering, uh, especially when people aren't social distanced. Um, I, I will tell you, you know, we, we really kept a close eye on um, uh, the outcomes of the protests that we saw months ago. Uh, we did not see any incidents of spread um, from those protests. Um, again, by and large, people were, were wearing face coverings and, of course, outdoors. So, you know, when I think when we are, you know, taking these deep dives into our data right now, it really is these indoor settings where people don't have face coverings on, um, where that's really driving the spread in our state. And so, frankly, I'm more concerned about, you know, how many people were, you know, gathering with friends, watching football games or watching the, um, the Biden um, speech at home uh, indoors probably than those people that were gathering. But I do agree, you know, those individuals who um, were, were gathering in less than six feet, they should get tested just to make sure. Governor, on the school's note, uh, I believe Philadelphia taking some action today to delay the return to in-person uh, things there. You guys brought up the metrics that the state is looking at. Uh, and I think we're at, you only need two, I think, if I recall correctly. Is that Two and yellow. Two. Yeah. Right. And so my, my question is, with where we're at with red right now, do you think schools need to anticipate, based on the trend that we're seeing, that they may need to go back to remote learning? No, I think they should continue to, to, to uh, with their plans to move children back into in-person instructions in, a, in the hybrid kind, kind of way. We'll keep our focus on it, particularly in identifying uh, particular geographic areas where, where, there's, where there's outbreaks. Uh, but, uh, you know, what we're seeing around the world, uh, in Europe, you know, you've got restaurants and bars that are closed, they're required to be closed, and, 
and schools opening, and it, and, and it goes to the, the data that uh, Dr. Rattay was summarizing with respect to where spread is occurring and where it isn't occurring, and it's really those social, uh, kind of off-campus, unstructured social environments where people leave their guard down a little bit, aren't wearing uh, face coverings, uh, and that type of thing. And my, uh, I think that the, the teachers and staff, the school districts are doing an exceptional job gradually moving uh, children back into the hybrid model with some in-person in instruction and some uh, remote. Uh, and uh, for the time being, um, I think that's appropriate. Last thing I just have to ask, um, you mentioned earlier that you guys are looking at new restrictions. Um, are you considering any kind of capacity or operations limits for businesses? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of things are on the table, mostly um, things that are being done in, in other states around us. You know, we always, uh, have through the, the nine months, uh, going into nine months of this, have been tr trying to be consistent with what's happening in states around us so we don't create uh, cross-border in incentives as we did at one time with beaches and with uh, with liquor store stores in the northern part of our state. And so we'll continue to look at that and really try to make sure that the solution uh, or that the uh, restriction is uh, geared and focused towards the problem. Uh, and it's a little bit hard to do that given that the problem seems to be these informal social gatherings, you know. You know, it's, it's riskier to be um, with a, a, a crew having pizza and beer, watching a football game with 10, 15 folks at your home than it is in a struct more structured environment outside, particularly outside and outside of the home. So uh, all of those things we'll be looking at to try to, we've got to, we can't allow this thing to, to rage out of control again. Thank you. Thank you. How are you, Governor? Good, how are you? Good, Tom asked uh, two of my questions. But related to um, what you were just talking about, I did want to I did want to try to get to some specifics, if we can, about what is on the table and what is off the table. And the reason that I'm asking that, in terms of restrictions, the reason that I'm asking that is because you said back in October that the state isn't going to be able to do a shutdown similar to the one that we went through earlier this year. That that wouldn't be sustainable. So I really am curious to hear. I know that you're looking at other states to you know kind of make those decisions, but. Am I hearing correctly that at-home gatherings could be restricted um, if the spread continues? Yeah, well, you know, we tried that a little bit with respect to mask wearing with, within the homes. And, you know, we're not about to go knocking on doors and enforcing mask wearing in, in people's homes. I think it's really a question of, you know, we rely almost exclusively, not exclusively, but largely on voluntary compliance. And so the, really the question really is, how do you achieve that? And then what do you make voluntary and what do you make mandatory? And some of, and some of it is, is just signal, signaling and messaging. And so you might say, well, wait a minute, if, why are you limiting outdoor gatherings to a number lower than the current uh, limit, which I think is 250? Uh, and it's in some ways, to, it's to signal that we need to be more careful. Uh, actually, where we need to be more careful is on indoor environments. And actually, the unstructured indoor environments uh, are the ones that are harder to get to, but the most, uh, it seems to be where the greatest risk is, as opposed to indoor environments where you can impose restrictions like restaurants that uh, can create uh, barriers to transmission. And so those are the kinds that we're really trying to kind of hit a, a sweet spot or, or try to, to strike a balance that recognizes the needs of a healthy community and the needs of a strong economy, right? And it's a tough call. Well, I'm wondering if um, businesses should brace for another shutdown of any kind. I'm just thinking about the, th I'm thinking about the repercussions of the shutdown earlier well, this year. Well, I can year. tell you what they've been doing uh, for months is finding more creative ways of, of delivering their product or their services. Um, whether you're talking about a retail establishment, and they've gotten really good at it. 
Um, I, I, I mention my favorite Wawa all the time, you know, because I, I go there every morning for my coffee. They're, they're just, they're really good at it now. And, and I know uh, restaurants with outdoor spaces are really good. Now it's getting colder, I get that, and they're looking at different ways to make that work. Same thing in, in New Jersey, uh, I've seen uh, outdoor dining. So folks are getting really creative, and, and we need to be certainly thoughtful and creative as we think about what, are, what kind of restrictions will get the job done in both cases, both in terms of business activity and in terms of, of, uh, of the health of the community. And by the way, if you let the virus rage out of control, you're defeating the purpose, right? Because then people aren't going to go to restaurants and, and all the rest of it. If I'm hearing you correctly, a decision has not been definitively made right. about what's next. But is there anything? I'm I mean, I think it's important to lay it out there what we're looking at. Mm -hmm with a sense of urgency that says, let's do this voluntarily. Let's all pull together. Let's really wear a mask. Let's be cautious and conscious of what we're doing and, and watching you know, uh, the sporting event or the movie with friends at home. You know? I think about it a lot because my mother is in that vulnerable category and we, we like to see her and she likes to see us. And, if everybody thinks about it in those terms, and people do, don't get me wrong, I think we have strong compliance, which is why we've been better than all the other states. But now we're slipping in the wrong direction. And I think it's just people are getting tired and, and whatever. But when you see, like as we have today, where we've got a vaccine coming, come on, let's hang in there. Let's, let's, let's buckle down. Let's lean into it for a little while longer um, and, and protect uh, the gains that we've made in reopening businesses, in getting children back to school. So I, I don't mean to keep prying about this, but I just want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding. No, it gives me an opportunity could, to, to, to really lean into our message. Could indoor gatherings, because I think it, it appears that indoor gatherings are happening more often and with more people without masks, including in this state. Are, should people expect, if these cases keep surging and people don't, abide by the social distancing guidelines that you guys have put forward, that indoor gatherings could somehow be restricted in some way this winter? We might have, we might have to do something that it gets the attention of folks so that it's more top of mind, right? Okay. So I did have another question um, about something else that you already brought up, which is the vaccine and the Pfizer news. Um, you mentioned, Dr. Rote, that uh, if I heard you correctly, December might be, we can expect perhaps the vaccine to become available in, in at least a uh, limited amount of doses by December. And it's, the, of course, the first people in line will be either at-risk groups or people who are most likely to contract it, like first responders, like you said. For the average Delawarean who is not high risk, which is a lot of the state, when can they expect to, at this point, when can they expect to um, get their hands on the vaccine? Yeah, Sarah, I wish I knew. Um, I really, and I, and I wish I could say January, but um, likely, I mean, I think optimistically, maybe March, April, and uh, probably really it will become more widespread uh, late spring, summer. Um, if it's before then, I think we'll, we'll all be dancing in the streets with, with face masks on. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think, um, you know, it's a large quantity of vaccine that needs to be produced to, uh, to vaccinate um, our nation. And so um, it's clearly important that we prioritize and um, we, uh, you know, focus on saving as many lives as we can and, and keep, keeping uh, Delaware up and running. But, um, um, yeah, I mean, we are really looking forward to the time when we have abundant supply of, of vaccine, and I just don't anticipate that any, any earlier than March, and I think that's, would, that's optimistic. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thanks for coming. We also have uh, some pre-submitted to question from media across the state, and Haley's got those questions. All right, first question is from Nick Cialino at Delaware Public Media. How concerned are you about the level of guidance and support the state will get from the federal government between now and President-elect Biden's inauguration? 
What kind of contact does the state currently have with the White House Coronavirus Task Force? Yeah, so I, I talk about our interaction with the White House Task Force almost on a weekly basis. Uh, we have a weekly call uh, with the task force. Uh, normally, it's the case that the Vice President uh, uh, coordinates the call with uh, representatives from CDC, NIH, uh, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, uh, more recently with the, uh, the team that's been uh, working on Operation Warp Speed with the vaccine, and so I would expect that that will continue. Uh, we will and will continue to get updates on uh, personal protective equipment that needs and stockpiling. So I would expect that that would continue. Next question is from Amy Cherry at WDEL. This is for Dr. Rate. Newark's Cafe Gelato is planning to use small greenhouses to continue outdoor dining into the winter. What concerns does DPH have as businesses need to find ways to keep capacity up to stay viable in the winter with the pandemic? Yeah, that's a, a really great question. And, and, and I, I want to start with by saying our, our Delaware restaurants have done an amazing job innovating and uh, really uh, being responsive to, uh, to this crisis. And, um, um, and although, you know, you, you've heard us uh, say we have concerns about indoor dining. Um, I, I think it's really fantastic that our restaurants are thinking about creative ways in which they can continue um, the outdoor dining that they've been able to establish for, for Delawareans. Um, I don't know much about the small greenhouses that uh, Cafe Gelato is thinking about. Um, I'm hoping that, that they and, and others who are thinking about innovative ideas do uh, collaborate with uh, Jamie Mack and his team. We want to make sure that what they you know, invest in is actually safe. Um, outdoor dining is great, but anything with walls has the potential to actually be more dangerous. Um, some people um, uh, started using igloos in other parts of the country, and they were found finding that actually they're, um, that was even a riskier setting than even normal indoors. So we just want to make sure that uh, whatever um, th uh, these restaurants are are really um, focused on investing in uh, is 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 going to be a good solution. Next question from Amy Cherry at WDEL. Under the former metric of persons positive. Delaware's reopening formula would have gone red last week. Can you explain why the new formula is being used and how you came up with the 8% as a threshold? Yes, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rate, but just uh, we can show one of the slides earlier that showed uh, the total number uh, when you used just persons tested uh, for that uh, percent positive, 369,000, compared to when you use uh, the total tests that are administered. It's almost 600,000, big difference there. And so as you, and the rele more relevant uh, calculation is using the 599,000, so the total test to give you some idea of the current spread of the virus in the community. Uh, so it's more meaningful and uh, Dr. Rattay and, and public health recommended that we move towards it. Most states are doing it. and. Uh, there's another part of that question, I guess, that, that you can answer with respect to the 8% threshold. We did say earlier that, unfortunately, 20-some states are already above 8%, and so um, it's not certainly not uh, a threshold that, uh, that some states haven't cr crossed already. Yeah, um, I mean, we, I, 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 th I think we all, we all believe um, it was absolutely the right thing to, to do to move to the test-based approach um, because the person-based ap approach re really is, is, is no longer as um, ne this far into the pandemic when many people are getting tested multiple times. Um, the person-based um, uh, measure just isn't a great indicator of... Um, true community spread. And so the test-based me measure uh, is a better um, metric to follow. Um, now, the CDC and the White House Task Force and Hopkins and others uh, use 10% as the metric for test-based positivity. Um, we felt that uh, that wasn't as true of a reflection of community spread and that we needed to be more conservative than um, what CDC 
and the White House and Hopkins were recommending. So we decreased to that 8% as the threshold because, it, again, we, we, we felt that um, uh, we, we needed to be more conservative and we wanted it to be a um, closer match to community spread. And as the governor said, uh, when I looked last week, over 26 states or 26 states were already over that 8%. Next question is from Jacob Owens at Delaware Business Times. With the election of President-elect Joe Biden, how does the state anticipate taking advantage of this newfound spotlight on Wilmington and the state of Delaware as a whole, whether through leveraging federal resources, attracting new economic development, or boosting tourism? Yeah, so I think it's a real opportunity for our state to get uh, a lot of attention. Obviously, the eyes of the world were on Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, just a week ago or just a few days ago over the weekend uh, when uh, President-elect uh, had uh, his speeches and, and uh, Vice President-elect uh, uh, accepting uh, the results uh, of the election. And so I think we'll see, we'll continue to see that. We'll certainly use it in uh, marketing uh, Delaware as a place to, to do business and, and certainly uh, for tourism purposes to, uh, it'll be an opportunity for for us to attract visitors, more visitors. Uh, we have a thriving tourism industry already, uh, notwithstanding the effects of COVID-19. Some of the best beaches in the world, just a wonderful place uh, to live and work. And, and so we'll be, have a chance to, to emphasize all of that uh, by being the home state of, of uh, the next president of the United States. And we're all very proud of Joe. We're proud to be, be Delawareans, and I think it'll be good for us. You know, we've always, done well by our congressional delegation, as long as I can remember, Democrats and Republicans, it's all Senator Corper, Senator Coons, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester now, with respect to federal resources, and uh, I certainly can't uh, hurt with uh, our own Joe Biden in the, in the White House. But the main things will be tourism uh, and economic development, and, and just the sense of pride. We get to puff out our chest a little bit and, and be proud that uh, the President of the United States is, calls Delaware his home. So last question from Tim Furlong at NBC. What are your thoughts on potential changes to your COVID strategy now that President-elect Biden won? Have you discussed this with their team? Yeah, so I've had a brief uh, conversation with some of uh, their staff uh, with respect to uh, their approach and maybe some of the concerns that we have. We've put together a really strong uh, team, I expect, and, and the President-elect uh, uh, formed a, a COVID-19 a task force put, you know, really uh, top-notch scientists uh, in charge representing different approaches to public health. I think that's going to be great and helping us uh, sort out uh, the science and, and finding uh, the best approaches. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we depend on the federal government in a big way for resources, for personal protective equipment, for testing uh, supplies, uh, and we also uh, expect uh, and, and do better with some flexibility at the local level with respect to the implementation of emergency orders and expect that that'll be part of it, but a kind of a stronger, you know, messaging. Messaging is important. You know, when face covering is such an important part of our response to uh, mitigation on COVID-19, uh, having that kind of uh, example set by the President of the United States makes a difference. And so, We'll expect that, but clearly, uh, you know, we've had a good relationship with the White House Task Force, and we expect that that'll get even stronger uh, with the with the Biden team uh, in in force, and hopefully, we'll get to the point where we're really uh, talking about distributing vaccines and getting uh, getting really back online again. So that was the the last question. Again, I want to thank everybody. For joining us again this week, thank Dr. Rate and A.J. Shaw for their tremendous work and the work of their teams. Again, tomorrow's uh, Veterans Day. I want to thank all of the veterans, those active duty, military, uh, and veterans who have served our country and served it so well, made uh, it possible for all of us to exercise our right to, uh, to the vote last, just a week ago uh, today. Uh, in which we uh, chose elected leader, leaders at the national level and at the state level. And, and to that, I want to just express my appreciation and thanks for those of you who supported me in the re-election. It's a, a great privilege uh, to serve with tremendous responsibility. Uh, 
I'm a firm believer in, in the return day ethic, uh, which says that the elections are now over. Yeah, we're Democrats and Republicans, but first and foremost, we're Delawareans, and it's our job uh, to, to uh, serve the best interests of, of every Delawarean, whether you voted for me uh, or the other side. And I also want to extend my congratulations to my opponent and to all the, uh, the candidates who ran in the election just a week ago. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to our veterans tomorrow. Uh, God bless you and see you next week.